morning. We welcome you all to the Bible study portion of this service. We are live on Facebook and Zoom as we speak. We hope that this will be a boon to all of us as we get into the, the busy part of the summer season. People come and people go and people go into the Grand Canyon and wherever you're at, you can still join us for a worship and Bible study here at Grace. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you again. It's not a dream. We actually did get back together, and here we are again. Father, thank you for gathering these folks here today. Thank you for those who are joining us virtually. Thank you, Lord, for the way your word never comes back void, but always bears increase. So, Lord, quicken our hearts to receive your word today. In Christ's holy name, amen. Our Bible study this morning is from the book of Joshua, and we're going to do a couple of weeks in Joshua. This is a, a rather famous passage of the book of Joshua where he and the people enter the promised land. Uh, there are some streams of Christianity that think the Old Testament is not quite as up to snuff scripturally as the New Testament. This is one of the first heresies that the church ever encountered, and it has not gone away. There are still lots of folks who feel that way. The book of Joshua is all about after Moses, after the greatest leader in history, after this great prophet passes away, now what? And the now what is, they go marching into the promised land. The name Joshua, this would give you a clue if you actually technically spoke Hebrew. I confess to you, I never took a class in Greek or Hebrew because I felt like it would waste my time. You know that old thing of don't try to teach a pig to dance because it wastes your time and it annoys the pig? That, that's how I felt about learning Greek and Hebrew. Don't, don't waste my time with it. It'll just annoy the pig. But uh, I knew that I had resources from people who were experts in Greek and Hebrew that I could look up. So there was no need for me to try to become an expert myself. I am an expert in knowing who to look up. <laughs> the name Joshua has been anglicized from the Hebrew Bible. It's actually Yeshua. Oh, and by the way, the name Jesus has actually been anglicized from the Greek Bible. It's actually Yeshua. So this should give you a clue that this is a pretty important book. If Yeshua is our Savior, and Yeshua is the one who led the people into the promised land, it ought to give you pause to go, hmm, maybe this is important. And what we often call this, it's not strictly speaking prophecy through the whole book, but a foreshadowing. This Yeshua had to lead his people into the promised land, just as our Yeshua comes to us to lead us into God's promise. Now, a lot of people are reluctant to embrace the book of Joshua because there's lots of battles in Joshua, right? And, and you know, this is a common rap you've heard about the Old Testament. Oh, I don't like the Old Testament because it's all full of battles and bloodshed and war. I like love. I like the New Testament, all the love. There are a couple of reasons that I still have no problem embracing the book of Joshua. One is a scholarly reason. When you follow the progression of the children of Israel going into Egypt with essentially one extended family with 12 boys, and you follow it to the time of Moses. Then you follow from the time of Moses to the time of the promised land. The scriptural references talk about 
a population explosion that is not just an explosion, but an explosion of, of the people of Israel. And, and pretty much in order to meet the number of people who came out of Egypt and then the number of people who went into the promised land, you'd have to have everybody have a hundred children a year. Uh, even by celebrity standards, that's a lot, right? Uh, everybody would have to have a hundred children a year, first of all, from the time of slavery, and then for that 40 year period in the wilderness, they'd have to be, well, let's say they'd be too busy to wander around much. So how did this happen? There's a couple of possibilities. One is that they had each had a hundred children a year. Possible. The other possibility is that they figured out the best way to destroy your enemy on the way is to make them your sister or brother and learn to love them and make them part of your family. And if that's true, then the movement of God has been evangelical to the core from the very beginning. I mention this because I feel this is extraordinarily important as we stand with Joshua on the River Jordan today and say, okay, which direction is the Lord leading us? If from the beginning, the battles of God have actually been won by reaching out and bringing people into the family, saying, okay, you used to be nobody, but now you can be children of Abraham with us. You can be children of the promise. You can be folks who are going to the promised land. And if the same thing happened after Joshua crossed the Jordan, if all of those battles were in fact battles, but if most of them were involved with the battle for hearts and minds, let's see, hasn't that come up of late in our own military strategy that it doesn't matter how big your guns are if you don't win the hearts and minds? So I think it makes sense, it makes sense to me that from the get-go, God's promise has been evangelical and concerned with bringing people into the family. Just, the, does that make sense to anybody else? The other reason that Joshua doesn't seem important to me at all is, guess what? Life is full of battles. And it's good to know that the one who has your back is on the pages of these scriptures. The one who says, don't be afraid. We're going to win this thing. Not survive this thing. We're going to win this thing. That also makes sense to me. And I have to confess that for all people of color, books like Joshua provide tremendous hope because they're living on the thin edge of the wedge. And this is a promise that God hears their cries, knows what they need, and is going to lead them forward. The third point I want to make, we've talked a lot about covenant over the past couple of weeks, and the Ark of the Covenant doesn't just become a box they carry around. The Ark of the Covenant develops a personality and becomes a living character in the story of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was where they put the word of God that Moses brought down from the mountain. And this word of God made them more than children of Abraham, more than escaped slaves. It made them into the people of God. The word of God was God's way of trying to elbow aside a little bit of elbow room for a different creation. It's like Genesis 1 all over again. It's trying to elbow aside enough room where the strong don't rule over the weak, where sex is not used for domination, where idolatry is not rampant, where bloodshed is not rampant. It's trying to elbow aside a little room for sanity. 
And that Ark of the Covenant is the physical embodiment of the Word of God that makes God's people into God's people. The next time we had another embodiment of the Word, we called his name Yeshua. And he was laid in a manger by a maid. But up until then, this is the most precious gift of God and reminder of the covenant until we had the covenant child instead of the covenant box. Finally, I want to share with you, of course, the name Yeshua, Jesus, means deliverer. Moses was the lawgiver. His name literally means drawn out. His mother drew his, his uh, mother, put him in the water, and Pharaoh's daughter drew him out. And she called him Moses, the one who is drawn out. Moses, by his very name, was the one destined to draw his people out of slavery. But he was not the deliverer, he was the lawgiver. The law made God's people into God's people. But it could not by itself, the law could never get you from this world into the promised land. You have to be delivered. You have to be redeemed. You have to be saved to get to the promised land. So Moses could never get there. Yeshua could get there. And Yeshua is still the hope for all of us to get to God's ultimate promise. How's that for a whirlwind tour? We didn't actually technically read a single word from the book of Joshua, but now I've set the stage so that you can read this book and all of a sudden go, ow, now I get it. So go ahead and share with me what are, what are your thoughts so far? Any aha moments? Any what the heck are you talking about preacher moments? Uh, Robbie, are you awake? I am awake. But no way. Come on. I really. was lost reading this. <laughs> I'm glad I got here when I did. I really <laughs> wouldn't understand. All right. We're, we're always glad you get here. <clears throat> I'm sorry. We're always glad when you get here. Well, that's the way it should be. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know I feel blessed every time I wake up in the morning. But getting, getting here with these folks, that's such extra special. Yeah, isn't it cool to come back the second yeah. week and go, okay, this is real. We're yeah. really going to do it. It's not a dream. Amen. Any other Joshua thoughts so far? Well, in, I was studying Joshua, and I was so impressed with the individual. That Chris and I named our son <laughs> after the book of Joshua. Wow. It, it was a name that had fallen into disfavor for a while, but came back with a vengeance. And it's good to know that you did it not because it was cool, but because God moved on you. And, uh, so, yeah, uh, Joshua was a longtime comrade of Moses, and he was one of the ones that. When Moses was lifting up his hands over the battle, Joshua stood there beside him, holding his hands up. And we need lots of Joshua's in our prayer life, people to hold us up while we're praying. What else do you think? So Moses was the lawgiver. Joshua was. Has the same name as Jesus. And it's called the same type of deliverer. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely in, in, um, enlightening me. Um, but you can't say that Joshua was Jesus because Jesus was the word incarnate and the box was the word incarnate. So until help me with Joshua, <laughs> but he was still just a prophet. Not just. So, you know, I'm a storyteller. Everything reminds me of a story. It's always a rabbit trail. Just stay with me. This applies. It's just not going to immediately appear. Why? 
Um, one of our traditions that everybody knows about, but nobody really understands about the native community is the tradition of the, the sacred pipe. And in, in short, oversimplifying terms, the, the point of the pipe is that it's our prayers made visible so that there are no lies between us and purifies the air. Very simple, very, very overly simple, but here's the thing. When somebody has been taught to do the sacred pipe ceremony, they're not supposed to have any photographs or videos of that moment out of respect and honor that you're supposed to do it live or not at all, not relive it on video. So as you can imagine, the past 15 months, as we have tried to have Native American events, it's been hard for us to put a, a sacred pipe ceremony on Zoom without putting it on video, right? And so the solution that some folks have come up with, not a perfect solution, but it's a solution. They do the ceremony behind a backlit screen, a paper screen or, or what have you, with a floodlight behind it and their shadow is cast onto the screen. So the, they themselves are not being broadcast, but you can see the foreshadowing of the real thing. Now, that's a pretty good way to read the Old Testament and foreshadowings always break down. Like there's going to be some moment where he lifts the pipe and it looks like his nose is two feet long, right? And if you're if you're analyzing that too much, um, this reminds me, by the way, of Jesus' miracle after he's resurrected of the draft of fishes while the disciples have been out fishing. And we have recorded in the Gospel of John that there were 153 large fish. What that means is somebody was sitting there with the risen Lord beside them going 48, 49, 50, 51. Oh, those moved. I'm going to have to start over. One. And, and God bless them because that is completely not my personality to, to remember to count the fish. But I need people like that around me who are going 87, 88, 89. So when you start talking about foreshadowing, it works best in poetry, not in breaking down the details and going, so I noticed that the nose at one point is two feet long, and it, it's always going to break down. And, and if you try to get one-to-one -one correspondences, it, it's always going to fall apart. But for, for those of us who are not of a Jewish mindset and are, are trying to understand what the Old Testament means to us, I think Understanding it as a shadow cast on a wall uh, so that we can make sense of what we see in person in the New Testament. Uh, I find that a helpful metaphor. Any other Joshua thoughts? Or do you want me to just project your shadow on a wall for you? I don't have Robert here to go second. Uh, I don't know where he gets off not being here to go second. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Thanks for ruining second for us, Robert. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's go ahead and dive in a little bit farther into covenant. 
We talked a couple of weeks ago about the fact that covenants are different from contracts. Anybody remember any of the characteristics of a covenant that make it different from a contract? Help me out here. Right? It doesn't expire. It doesn't expire. That's the main one. And a covenant's a promise. It's not you know, legally bound. Exactly. Uh, you're, you're not legally bound. These are the considerations uh, in any contract you signed to buy a car, buy a house, Bill can tell us about contract law, I'm sure. There is a thing called consideration. Each side gives consideration to the other. The consideration of a real estate contract is you get a house and you ain't paid for it. But your consideration is you promise to go on paying for it one month at a time. So that's not how a contract, how a covenant works. A covenant is open-ended and it doesn't ask, what do I owe you? It asks, what do you need? Any other memories about, con about uh, uh, covenants? Any of those other characteristics pop out? I just think it's, uh, it's, it's not interpreted in this day and age. I don't know that a lot of people think of it as intense as um, as biblically. Um, I do remember uh, disciple actually disciple class very bringing up the fact that we've actually signed the covenant. So it's um, it's not like we're not inviting people in, but you start at the beginning and and it goes to the end, and you've made a, a promise for the for this particular thing, marriage um, as a covenant. I, I wonder how many times that comes off the tongue at the service and and um, folks aren't really aware of what that means. Yeah, it happens a lot where uh, folks say covenant and what they mean is temporary agreement. Uh, there's often folks uh, in, in my line of work that want to say, well, uh, we're going to covenant this, and we're going to covenant that. And they don't mean covenant at all, really. Uh, all they mean is temporary. Uh, but covenant uh, is much more serious than, than we tend to think of it, and it, it does involve giving blood usually as a sign of life itself, how sacred it is. Uh, it also always has some sign of surety. Uh, in, a, in a wedding, in a marriage, that ring is supposed to be a sign of surety. Uh, these days, it often is more of a temporary contract, but that's what that's supposed to mean. In biblical times, what they often would do is erect a monument, a um, stone altar, some pillars, something that would stand and last forever and be visible. In jungle areas, they would choose a long living tree and that would be the covenant tree that would be marked as remembrance. And ancient people don't forget this stuff. But uh, y'all, we're, uh, we're all at ease here. We want you to come in as you feel like coming in and just relax. Uh, by the way, y'all, this is something uh, some of you may want to help me serve as, uh, as greeters, not just ushers, but greeters. Because uh, I want folks to feel like they can come into the living room from this door or that door and just come on in, be seated. We'll we'll uh, we'll make everybody feel at home. We want this to be a family gathering, uh, and uh, it's hard because everybody goes, "Oh, I don't want to disturb the preacher." If you're not disturbing the preacher, just come on in. And so we've been talking about how sacred covenants are and the signs of surety in some places they would form an alliance between two warring clans by having a marriage and the child of that marriage becomes the sign of the covenant and that lineage becomes the sign of the covenant between those warring clans forever this is why it's such a big stinking deal with the old testament prophets when kings like solomon start marrying all of these 
foreign women who bring in their foreign gods because each one of them comes with a covenant to another god. And this god is a jealous god who only allows us to covenant with Yahweh. So it sets the tone for the whole New Testament. Joshua, when he crosses the river, says, oh, okay, okay. Not only are we going to wade into the river and, and see the miracle, but once we get there, we're going to wait while somebody picks up 12 stones, not pocket stones. The, this much I know about Hebrew. The word is very specific. The, the word, I, I can't pronounce it, so I'll try. But the word means big old stone. Big as you can carry. And each one of these 12 guys picked up 12 stones. And all the while, the priests are watching the water up there, holding the Ark of the Covenant, thinking, but the scripture says, behold, those stones are there to this day. If you go to Australia, the Aboriginal culture there is astonishing. It dates back at least 30,000 years. And the Aborigines there can still tell you who made the carvings, who made the painting, who made them on what occasion and why. They still have all of that memorized. The same thing is true for God's people as they enter the promised land. It's there is a memorial for the children. And when the youngins say, Daddy, you've got some mighty strange ways. Why do you do this? What is all this stone stuff about? They can say, let me tell you about that day. That was the day God parted the waters for us. So a covenant is also something that's meant to be passed on. I'm going to wrap up our Bible study portion at this time. We're going to have an angelic musical interlude. We'll come back together for, uh, for coffee. Uh, I highly recommend you go get some coffee. It's on the room back there. Stand up, stretch. Uh, you know, the mind cannot <clears throat> absorb what the seat cannot endure. <laughs> and I'm grateful that these seats are cushioned, but they do wear thin after a while. So go ahead, greet one another, welcome each other. We'll come back together in about five minutes with the rest of the story. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to do that just because we said <laughs>
stop singing. Oh. <laughs> Just the ladies went through the woods and forest glades. I want. Yeah. <laughs> 
Bring it in. Bring it in. I got you.
The crossing on the ground on dry grass. <laughs> you might be better like this. No, but you can't even see it there. All right. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men and tell them, tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from, from right where the priests are standing, and carry and carry them over with you and put them down at the down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men and said to them, Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder to serve as a sign among you in the future when the children ask what are, what are these stones mean tell them that the flow of the jordan was cut off from the ark of the covenant covenant of the uh, through the ark of the covenant of the lord these stones are a these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So they took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan and they carried them to their camp. Joshua set up the 12 stones and they are, and they are there to this day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you lead us in a word of prayer, Rabbi? Okay. <laughs> All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day, for this beautiful congregation you brought before us. And help us do your bidding because we are unworthy of all you, you've given us. In our Savior's name, amen. 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 Thank you, Father. <clears throat> I want to say this something in all sincerity about this guy. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> he never good. faces more obstacles and hardships every day by 8 a.m. than most of us do in a lifetime. And he does it with a sense of humor and a sense of faith. And he encounters all those obstacles, and most of them. Mess him up real bad. <laughs> and you know what? He laughs at the truth, he shrugs his shoulders, and he goes through them. And I just want you to tell how much you honor this man. Oh, okay. all of that. I'm glad I'm here. All of it. Amen. We're grateful you're here. You're Thank you. I, uh, I can't imagine being anywhere else. So, thank you. It's all you So we've read from <laughs> the book of Joshua today. The past couple of weeks, we've talked about a couple of peculiar miracles. Miracles of resurrection, miracles of new life, miracles of new start. We started out with the uh, prophet Ezekiel. Aren't you glad you didn't have to say Ezekiel? Dear Lord, Lord. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We started out with the prophet Ezekiel, who was picked up by the hand of God, given a uh, valley of dry bones as his first preaching appointment. Uh, I got to tell you, Grace looks pretty good compared to the valley of dry bones. <laughs> and uh, it said, prophesy. Now, that's not predict the future. That's tell the will of God. And preachers are called to do that once a week, but every Christian is called to do that every day. Speak the will of God. Prophesy to these dry bones. Tell them it's time to live. And even when something started to move and something started to happen, there was a bunch of dust kicked up. There was still no life. So God said, Ezekiel, prophesy to the spirit itself. Prophesy to the spirit to come. And until God got Ezekiel to speak up, those bones could not rise up. 
Same thing was true with our friend Lazarus last week. Jesus was ready to work the greatest miracle the world had ever seen. And the world was desperate to see, is it true that death is not the end? Death is not the final word. Death is not the ultimate power. Is it true? Because we have no evidence that it's not true. So we love to see that evidence, Lord. The world desperately wanted to see that miracle. Jesus desperately wanted to do it. But Jesus couldn't begin until somebody got involved and rolled a stone out of the way, putting in some skin in the game, some sweat, some toil, some strain, and maybe a sore back the next day. God wants to work miracles, but God himself can't start until somebody takes a risk. We continue that line of thought today with this story of Joshua leading his people into the promised land. It's a story at least 800 years in the making. It's the culmination of the promise given to two senior citizens in what would become the modern day Iraq calling them to come out to seek a promised land that they were going to give to children they didn't have. And that promise, scholars debate about this because that's what scholars do. Um, you can't be a scholar if you don't have your own scholarly opinion that disagrees with other scholars and gets published. <laughs> scholars disagree about how long it was from Abraham and Sarah receiving that promise to Joshua leading the people to inherit that promise. But a good guess might be 800 years. 800 years. What were your ancestors doing 800 years ago? Curiously, I probably have a better idea what they were doing on the Cherokee side of my family than I do on the European side of the family. Because nobody knew what was going on in, in Europe 1,200 years ago. I'm, I'm sorry, in the year 1,200 AD, 800 years ago. If your ancestors were among the minority of people who spoke English, 800 years ago, then you couldn't have understood a word they were saying <laughs> because it was Middle English. It was more German than it was English. It, it doesn't sound anything like modern English. That was still a couple hundred years away. So even if your ancestors told you what they were doing 800 years ago, you probably couldn't understand it. Would any of you make a life-changing decision based on something your ancestors heard 800 years ago? <clears throat> Yet here were Joshua and his people ready to bet everything on this promise, and they were marching straight into a raging river. Uh, Jackie, you can let it go. Whoever's calling needs to know we're having church. <laughs> <laughs> so there they were with this promise in their hip pocket. And it hadn't been clear all along that this promise was going to survive. Promises are temporary, but covenants are eternal. And the reason the promise was still in effect was this was made by a covenant-making God who doesn't forget. There were lots of times along the way that it looked like that promise had been snuffed out. When the children of Abraham became nameless, faceless slaves to the most powerful man on earth, there was plenty of reason to think the promise was just dead on the right. 
when they were finally released, it wasn't always apparent that they were going to follow the promise. In fact, there were a lot of folks who were unhappy about this whole lifetime of wandering and wandering behind some crazy guy named Moses. A lot of them said, wouldn't we be better off just to go back to Egypt and say, yeah, let's do that slave thing over again? Because it's a peculiar trait of the human animal. We all tend to trust the hell we know more than an uncertain future that we don't know. So they followed the greatest leader God had ever given. It was Moses' leadership that kept them from going back. Moses was, to this point, the greatest prophet the world had ever seen. And he went up on the mountaintop and received the physical embodiment of the word. Remember, in the beginning, God had the word and it moved into the chaos and it created light and life and order. This was the word of God in physical form and put in a physical box to carry it because it was so sacred. This word transformed those people from being just children of Abraham into being the people of God. This word transformed the world just as surely as let there be light transformed the world. This world elbowed aside a little room for sanity and a world gone mad. And it was the most precious thing the world would know the physical embodiment of the Word of God, the most precious thing the world would know until the Word became literally flesh and dwelt among us and was laid in a manger in Bethlehem. This precious ark was the Word of God. And they couldn't turn back as long as they were carrying the word of God forward. But Moses finally died. It was the end of the old way. And who was going to take his place? Joshua was just his sidekick. It's like Robin taking over for Batman. It just doesn't work, right? Joshua stepped forward and said, okay, I got a plan, y'all. They said, great, here's the plan. See that river? We're going to march into it. They said, emergency parking lot meeting. <laughs> I've, I've had a few of these sermons in my years past where I got done and there was an emergency parking lot meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Joshua preached one of these. He said, and God said, we're going to walk straight into the river. They said, parking lot meeting. <laughs> Has anybody else got a plan? Any plan? Anybody else? Really? Can we come up with something else? Joshua said, no, no. This is, this is what God's saying to us as a people right now. We're going to march straight into the river. How do you suppose they decided who got to go first? <laughs> Maybe there was somebody volunteering, like Robbie. I want to go first. Put me in front. Maybe they had to draw straws. If it was me in first, I would have had to draw the first best choice for straw, for one thing. And I would not have been taking big old giant steps saying victory in Jesus. I would have been kind of edging my toe in saying, let's just see how this whole miracle thing works out. And going, oh, that's cold. <laughs> and I'd have been turning around to the people behind me going, stop pushing. <laughs> I'm going, I'm going, just stop pushing. But it wasn't just the person in front. It was all of them carrying the word of God forward. They all had 
to go into the river before the miracle started. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be great if the miracles would start before we get our feet wet? But that's kind of like looking out your front door and saying, I need to go somewhere today, but I'm going to wait until all the lights are green <laughs> before I head out. I don't know if you've been through Fredericksburg lately, <laughs> but I promise you, if you got to wait till all the lights are green, you're never going to get anywhere. It'd be great if God would work the miracle for us before we get our feet wet, but that's not how the miracle works, is it? God said, when you all get in the water, then I'm going to part the way for you and make a way over on dry ground. I would submit to you all that we as God's people stand shoulder to shoulder beside Joshua today. We are faced with a raging torrent of change. The world was changing fast before these past 15 months. And now, boy, howdy. The world is changing in a raging river, and it would be comfortable, it would be sensible for us to say, let's just back up here. Joshua's people had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They had gotten to where they were pretty good at. They probably said, look, Josh, we don't have to take the kingdom today, do we? We, we've been wandering for a while. Surely we can wander for 41 years. Not, not, let's just wait till the timing's better. It's tempting to look around and say, come on, y'all, let's just retreat back to what we've been doing the past 40 years, maybe the past 400 years. But let's just stay here where it's nice and safe because all our memories are too precious to risk. They could have said that about taking the Ark of the Covenant, the most precious relic of all, into that river. But Joshua understood that if the power of God is not sufficient to move us forward. If God's people can only hang on to a relic and keep it moving in reverse, then it's just an antique on the shelf of history. And if our memories of what God has done here at Grace, here in this area, here, here in Virginia, here with God's people, if our memories <laughs> do not move us forward in this river of change, then they're just an antique sitting on a shelf drawing dust, helping us to move in reverse. Over these past 15 months, God has called us out of the building, out into the world, out of reaching people, and hallelujah. It's working. <clears throat> but wouldn't it be great if before we step out any further <laughs> into this river of change, if God would just part the way for us and make it easy? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the way the miracle works is God parts the waters when God's people get their feet wet. When we march forward, when we move into the risk, when we move into the change, then God makes a way. Up until then, God waits for somebody to take that first step. Now, the good news is that guy, the first one to put his toe in the water, he didn't have to go alone. There were other people who went with him. But somebody still had to take the first step. Otherwise, they were all going to stand around there going, oh, I just had to go <laughs> oh, and talk to you guys. Oh, you Somebody had to take the first step. Somebody had to take the risk. 
God still needs somebody to get their feet wet before God can work the miracle. God still needs you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you for working miracles in our midst. And we even thank you for the changes we don't like. Lord, you're moving us in new ways, extraordinary ways, but you're moving us together. So, Lord, part the waters. Show us the, the way to move into a new era of your church, your life, your world. Father, take us out beyond these walls. Take us out to reach those who are in need all around us. And Lord, let the miracles begin today as we get our feet wet. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you again, Robbie, for setting the stage for us so well. At this time, once again, I'm going to share with you that in deference to those who are a little bit nervous still, uh, we're not going to physically pass the offering plate at this point, because that's the only thing we would do that everybody has to touch. Um, and uh, I got word yesterday that one of our, our families, they didn't want to uh, say much about it yet, but one of our families has been exposed again to COVID. And they're not able to join us today because they're in safety protocol. And it's, uh, first of all, let's thank God that uh, odds are very strong, that everybody's gonna be fine, everything's okay. But secondly, it's a reminder, isn't it? This thing isn't over. It's not over till it's over. Uh, so we still need to be vigilant. We still need to do things that aren't quite what we're comfortable with, what we're used to, but we still need to make those who don't feel comfortable safe coming back as well. Uh, so we remind you there's an offering basket back here on the table. We thank you for your donations and I, I should say it's a huge thing. You all have been so faithful. Uh, there are churches that will not pull out of this notice diet. There are churches that are, are going to fail because their, uh, their stewardship dried up over the past 15 months. You are not one of those. This church has survived and we're going to thrive because God's going to part the waters and make the way to even bigger things. But thank you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Let's go ahead and pray God's blessing on the altar. Lord, we thank you for the works of our hands and the gifts of our hearts. Lord, use these offering gifts for the blessing and upbuilding of your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I want to invite you to share your prayer concerns, uh, your joys. Uh, I, let's see, my other brother Larry and I both had a birthday this week, and uh, I don't know about you, I, I, I feel like I'm getting to where I'm having three of those a year. <laughs> I don't know how that's happening, uh, but I'm, I'm grateful that so far this week I've only gotten one year old. <laughs> that's that's a victory, right? Uh, we do want to pray for those. I'm sure there are others who are still battling COVID, battling uh, uh, other other problems. Uh, anyone else want to lift up any prayer concerns? I'd like to lift up Brandy's mom, Carol, and sis. Um, she fell two weeks ago and has got two broken bones in her neck. And she has pneumonia, and it's not going well. So. Prayers for Randy's mom. Yes, sure. Prayers for Richard Cobb, who's in the hospital, um, had an infection in his toe, 
they decided that it probably came from a spider bite. But we, we spray out and run these around, but we only have one kidney. So prayers for Richard. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Well, that's got my cousin who still had a uh, bad fall at work yesterday, broke her arm, and uh, cut her face up, and just is in a tough way right now. And welcome back, by the way. Oh, so <laughs> <good. Over> <laughs> Uh, it's a joy and I want to thank that for all the blessings because I stay uh, with my mom for almost two months, uh, all day, all night with my brothers and sisters sleep together. <laughs> we don't go anywhere because it's lockdown in Philippines. So we do a Bible study for the entire stay there. And it's a big blessing and so thank you Lord for that. And I lost my job three months ago, and I have a new job. Uh, three months ago. <laughs> I want to thank you for being with us and all the hours and the visits and the hours that we have. Thank you. 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 First for the uh, folks in Florida with the building collapse, mm -hmm. souls that have not been found yet. Pray that there are still somebody that or in a small space I can say. Prayers for the first responders and police. Amen. Um, as we turn our attention to national crises, national problems, uh, international. Uh, I'll confess to you, my heart's been heavy of late with not one, but two mass grave sites that have been discovered in, in Canada and near a residential school for indigenous children. This week, an additional 300 bodies have been discovered. And uh, I've, I've just been, you know, I'm kind of expected to speak about these kind of things for the conference. It's been hard for me to think what I would say. Um, I think as I weighed that story, the biggest tragedy of all is that until they found the graves, no one realized those children were missing. How, how can you have that many precious little children that nobody even notices are gone. And so once again, how much more does that tell us what's important in our world and in our lives? Cherish the children, love the families, be sure that nobody, nobody in our fellowship ever thinks that we don't notice, we don't count them, and that their presence matters. We'll always call them by name. Any other thoughts? Yes, Dorothy. I just found out yesterday evening that I'm going to be a great grandmother. <laughs> Hallelujah. Pregnancy and healthy babies. Grandchildren are God's best idea. <laughs> And uh, there's yes, Robert. <laughs> prayers and uh, and for a start of a let me put it this way: start of a new ministry. And I, it's such a privilege to be kind of be able to be something up in front here, helping lead worship here, especially in the singing and the music. And I'd like to have a new ministry of more than me together, leading music and singing and that kind of thing. And so those of you who may have been in something similar in the past here in this church, and maybe other people who have never done anything like this anywhere, come and talk to me about, yeah, I want to be part of something. So maybe we could call it a choir or something. I don't know. So, <laughs> you know, and we wouldn't be doing it right next Sunday or the next Wednesday. Sometimes so we can get me prepared for that coming up in the future. So come and mention it to me. Talk to me about it. Amen. Thank a choir you. of many. Choir of many, yeah, we'll, we'll do some churches call it a pickup choir. <laughs> yeah, come on. Uh, and, and along those lines, uh, 
uh, we need greeters, facilitators. Uh, uh, we want people to feel comfortable coming, going, getting up, getting a cup of coffee, hug somebody who's walking. We want you to feel like you're home here. We, we want to not be in, sit down and shut up. It's all good. We, we want you to be at home here. So we need folks at both doors to welcome people as they come in and encourage them just to feel at home. And uh, prayers, I guess I'll go back to last week's service, the same prayer of joy for seeing the faces that I haven't seen um, for 15 months that we haven't seen one another. Um, prayers for our fellowship or grace fellowship hall here the building if you build it you will come it has better circulation and met the needs for us to in a strict methodist environment get back to service because the rotation of air is better here and it's it's, it's beautiful to sit in here in a worship service and there's no skunk in the bay <laughs> and prayers for the skunk who has inhabited our crawl space and we believe he's gone but boy does it not smell good in <laughs> so prayers that we did have, uh, just prayers of joy that we did have this beautiful building that God built. Um, it's almost like God had a plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, in your sermon being, let's not let's make a think about it. And you know, <laughs> no, no <laughs> anybody's got great ideas for getting rid of stuff. <laughs> and along all those lines, keep in mind. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, we'll have a meeting here. We'll also have it on Zoom. Uh, we're calling it the uh, post-COVID reentry group. I don't care what you call it. We're visioning ways we can step into the water together. And uh, we want you to be part of that. We want you to help us scream. Uh, anybody who has any ideas, complaints, suggestions, you're welcome. Also, before we go in prayer, I, I should mention, it seems like a long time ago that this happened now. Uh, Barbara just loves when I mention her while I'm speaking. She, <laughs> she'll kill me later. But um, when you have melanoma, the doctor never says remission or cure. It just never comes up because melanoma always comes back. But we started this 18 years ago. For 13 years, she's had no sign of cancer. And the doctor finally, the oncologist has finally said to her this week, you don't have to go for any more tests until you feel you need one. And for us, that's close enough to cure <laughs> We're still not sure what to do with this amazing gift God has given us, but we are sure that God gave us that gift and to encourage others. So let's be encouraged as we pray together. Lord Jesus, you've heard our prayers. You know our hearts. You know each and every need better than we know them ourselves. And you know how to handle them far better than we know what to tell you. So Lord, help us get our feet wet. Open up the way for us. Make something miraculous. Lead us forward and give us the confidence of children as you teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We are sound temptation, and deliver us from evil, and the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Go now in the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Get your feet wet. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, a minute ago, I had to turn and greet somebody better looking than you. I highly recommend now that you stand, turn to your left, turn to your right, and greet somebody that you can go, oh, bless your heart. Bless your heart. I 